five seconds. We are live. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Dave Palmaville, the Director of Public Health in Fresno County. Thank you for joining on this call. Um, we wanted to spend some time. We've been doing a lot of conference calls with um, various groups that have been participating in the, the countywide response to COVID. And we thought, um, you know, kind of where we're at a bit of a crossroads where uh, we are at with regard to a, a summer term, turning to fall and concerns um, about uh, the oncoming flu season, as well as changes in the weather potentially driving up um, COVID cases. And so um, when we're at this uh, point of calm, I wanted to just have a, a, a broader briefing for all of our partners that have been working with us on this response. And so that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna talk a little bit about where we've been and uh, where we're headed. Uh, I wanted to have um, Dr. Zweifler uh, talk about some, Dr. Vore and I will cover that section. Uh, Dr. Zweifler, uh, a great new member of our team, who's been working with us uh, is going to talk about testing strategies and some changes there. And then Mary Morrison, who's been on the really the forefront of, of all of the uh, case investigations, is going to talk about uh, some of the challenges that we faced early on and then um, some of the adjustments that we made as a department and where, where we see um, we're stronger as we head into the fall. Um, Dewan Utec and Sonia De La Rosa. Um, Dewan's the uh, director of the Department of Behavioral Health and Sonia De La Rosa as a principal analyst with the County Administrative Office are gonna give us an update on the response to people experiencing homelessness. And then um, Dr. Trinidad Solis is gonna talk about our um, work with the ag community. We're very uh, happy to welcome her to our team. She's been working with us to try to um, advance uh, the public health protective measures specifically around the agricultural community. And then David Lucchini is going to give us an update on the school response. And uh, Melanie Ruvacaba will talk about a new health equity metric. And Joe Prado is going to talk about um, the COVID equity project. And the last two items are, are really kind of the focus of, of what we want to ultimately get to uh, in terms of the response within our community. Next slide, please. So, um, really from the from the onset of the pandemic, even the pre-pandemic time, we at the Department of Public Health looked at the pillars of public health um, to help guide um, what we would call a whole community response. And in doing that, we involved our initially very early on our uh, counter departments uh, in the county of behavioral health and social services because they provide so many services to members of our community. Um, they've been integrally involved in the um, response. But we also reached out to our medical providers, um, our faith-based organizations, schools, local governments, emergency responders, our homeless populations, skilled nursing facilities, adult residential facilities, primary care clinics, community-based organizations, and our media partners to try to you know, make sure that number one, we were communicating um, as early and often as we could. We were trying to um, make sure that as we went through the initial shutdown of many aspects of our community and trying to deal with the stresses of the healthcare system, uh, you know, addressing uh, shortages of, of personal protective equipment and, and um, increasing case rates and so forth, that um, we had all of our community involved. And the reason that uh, that was very important to us is that we fundamentally believe that that's how we can change our community as uh, health overall. Uh, it's what drives a lot of the work we've been doing over the last um, five or six years here at the Department of Public Health of really trying to build partnerships within our community. You know, we know that, for example, our faith-based organizations, you know, they didn't close. They've been providing services to the community even though they haven't been able to gather uh, inside of the buildings for many uh, days within the pandemic. Uh, we know that our schools didn't close, that they continued to serve meals and uh, make sure that the students had, um, as best we can do it, uh, opportunities to learn and grow. Um, we know that we want to get schools back to some sense of normalcy, but um, we also know that our schools have, have really provided a heavy lift during the COVID response, as has have our uh, skilled nursing facilities and adult residential facilities. So many of you on these calls, you've been talking with us every week 
and now we're we're trying to talk to the the collective universe um, more together as we go forward. Next slide. <clears throat> so the approach for a whole community uh, approach to responding to an emergency is really developed. Um, we we work with that a lot in our public health emergency preparedness programs and our um, uh, 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 county OES programs. So, you know, the idea is that, you know, local and state government are not going to come in and be able to solve all of a community's problems. In fact, the reverse is really true. The local and state governments, you know, can provide support for our communities as they respond. And so I put up just a few pictures here of showing how, you know, we have pulled together. We've got the, you know, the representation of the surge that occurred in our community with the hospital tents. We've got on the uh, uh, the one circle up there, the mask up campaign that was done by the community foundation, really stepping up and helping to lead our community through, you know, really uh, uh, trying to communicate with our folks, uh, our community as a whole, and encouraging people to um, take serious the uh, uh, public health protective measures that we were trying to put in place. The gentleman with the, the cart is actually delivering hand sanitizers and and educational information to a community in Huron, where we were able to work with um, some of our uh, ag partners to help uh, educate and provide resources to our farm workers. And uh, in, in the center, a very beautiful day out in the melon field, um, where you know on a, on a daily basis now, we have um, briefings of our uh, essential ag workers on you know safety precautions that they can take and and many of the uh, steps that we're trying to reinforce uh, with the, our ag community is to try to keep that workforce as safe as possible, not only while they're at work, but also while they're at home. And then that lower right hand picture, just uh, uh, pictures of a few of our staff that, you know, um, have worked so tire tirelessly on this response. Um, and these, this was at a point where we were having uh, and continue to do to have um, all of our staff check in uh, to make sure that we were uh, healthy and safe as we are coming into our building. Next slide. Much of what we do in public health, um, we can't do alone. And so that's really the foundation of what we, how we started this pandemic response is trying to involve as many of our community partners. Um, we've relied on them for the one picture there is of the, um, the testing site we set up, the first OptumServe testing site. Uh, that's been doing about 130 or 140 tests a day every day for, gosh, it's been the last um, four or five months, uh, and there have been more sites added. But um, you know that represents kind of the collaboration that um, the the Fresno City College, you know, they just jumped to and said, "How can we help? How can we make space available for you?" Um, we've done a lot of training of our staff, represented in the upper right hand corner. Um, this is actually uh, before we were doing a lot of the separation. We're doing much more virtually now, but we've trained hundreds of people to do case investigations. Um, many of them have come from your organizations uh, that we've um, provided uh, a lot of different um, uh, uh, support services over the last few months. And that lower picture, gosh, you know, that looks like home to me for um, uh, many of these months. And that's kind of our uh, war room in the Department of Public Health. Um, you can see in the picture Dr. Vora, who has been an absolute champion um, within our department, within our community. We're so thankful for his his leadership um, on this pandemic. He's sitting with Dr. Al Sagbini, our, our infectious disease doctor, who's been uh, who worked very closely with our congregate settings, skilled nursing facilities, and so forth. And um, Dr. Vora introduced us to Dr. Dillon. You've heard her on many of the calls. She's at the end. Uh, and then, of course, on the right is David Lucchini, our uh, director. This was very early on in the pandemic. In fact, um, uh, we had scheduled to paint the, the the room there, and you can see the paint colors uh, um, behind David, uh, where David's seated. And we've uh, painted the room and moved on. Um, but um, we spent a lot of time in this room, uh, uh, on conference calls, um, in planning sessions, and moving forward. And, and I want to extend uh, the thanks to um, the team that's worked on this in public health, and also to all of you that have been um, partners in trying to communicate uh, messaging to our, our various communities. And I will be the first to tell you, you know, you asked us tough questions and there were a lot of times where we didn't have good responses. And we came back and worked on it and tried to answer as many questions as you could. 
And there are times, I know we have some of our media partners on the call, um, where we were not able to answer all the questions that, that the media had for us. But I'll tell you, um, one of the hallmarks of our response, I believe, has been um, the open and um, ongoing communication that we've been able to have um, with our media partners, really led through Dr. Vora and his um, ongoing updates, but also the number of people from the public health team and the social services and behavioral health who have participated on those updates um, to the media, really um, being able to um, emphasize different parts of the pandemic response. And that's very important. Uh, the media, I think, has played a very important role in getting the public health messages out, doing all those great public service announcements, um, doing the town halls and, and really supporting uh, our community um, uh, through information that's been very helpful. And, and I am very thankful that we've um, gotten to this point. And I think as we go forward um, into the next few months, we wanna perfect that process and um, we'd welcome any feedback. Um, next slide. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Vora. I'm gonna step out, he's gonna step in, and then um, we will uh, move this uh, the presentation through the others um, as we go forward. I think you have the opportunity to ask questions in the chat, and um, we'll be able to hopefully address some of those questions um, as we go, go through the uh, webinar. But at this point, I'll turn it over to Dr. Vora for his presentation. Awesome. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, I really appreciate getting the chance to uh, do this forum. I think um, it's it's really uh, very uh, very much an appropriate time for us to do uh, kind of a strategic pause um, and and really review uh, the journey that we've all been on collectively. Um, maybe not physically together, but certainly um, spending a lot of time together on on our screens. Um, I call that planet Zumanji. So we've we've all been uh, occupants of this new planet and this new way of life. And um, I really just want to do a broad overview. Um, and I'm so glad that we have so many of our um, partners and stakeholders and, um, and and members of our own public health team here to flesh out. Um, what I'm going to try to do is just uh, paint with a, a rather broad uh, brush uh, just the contours of where we've been. Uh, and really, I thought I would frame my my regards, my remarks, um, uh, in in, uh, in in about ten different lessons that uh, we've learned. Uh, so I just call this uh, ten lessons learned uh, while we were responding to COVID nineteen within Fresno County. Um, and some of these uh, will hopefully seem very self evident um, and obvious, um, but you know, um, in medicine we like to say. Uh, you know, basic doesn't mean minor. Um, the the basic and the and the and the critical elements are sometimes just the most rudimentary uh, whenever it comes to health and wellness. Um, but here we'll go ahead and get started. Um, oh, they're going to advance the slide. Okay, yeah, go ahead. So uh, you know, I think first of all, um, it, it's it's e even though this has felt like a decade, it's only been six months. Um, and, and it's important to know that, you know, these six months have seen the rise of this new novel coronavirus. Um, it, it's, it's been a deadly infection, but it's been probably the most investigated microbe in the history of civilization. Uh, so just to st take a step back and think about how much we know about this illness, um, you know, every single case has been documented uh, and, and is being investigated um, across every county in California. Um, but we know that it's a deadly infection. Um, in fact, the CDC just published this morning um, how deadly this infection has been. Uh, and I thought that it was very eye-opening, so I was able to put that in our slide set. This slide just shows you um, what we've discovered as a part of the epidemiology of this illness, uh, which is that, um, you know, over the summer in, uh, in, in July, really, and into, um, into late July and August, we really saw a, 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 a sharp upward trend in the number of cases, uh, and that's represented by this blue uh, hill. Uh, and then that was followed by um, an upward trend in the number of people that were hospitalized several weeks later. Uh, and that was accompanied by an upward trend, unfortunately, in the number of deaths that we've seen. So this is a deadly illness. It does result in hospitalizations. Um, and this upward peak really was a very stressful time for us. 
Uh, it's really something that we learned a lot and we were um, very fortunate to have great partnerships and collaborators, but we don't want to revisit that. And so really everything that we've done ever since then is to try to prevent that upward peak from happening at that velocity again. Uh, and really that's what I, I think is, is worth just at the outset stressing because um, all of our all of our um, uh, projects and initiatives and programs are really trying to uh, limit the numbers of, of infected individuals as much as possible. Next slide. So this is the slide that I was talking about that just came out from the CDC today. Uh, and, and so we often get a question that, you know, yes, this is a deadly infection, but is it any more deadly than other things that, that you know, uh, claim lives? Uh, and, and this, I think, uh, pretty unequivocally um, documents that there was a sharp rise uh, in causes of death this year. So they basically trended the solid black line and the dash um, black line are what is expected year to year. Um, and then the blue hills that you see in the springtime uh, and then also um, later in the summer, there was a second um, sort of surge. Uh, and these are nationwide trends in the numbers of deaths. Um, and, uh, you know, at least two out of three of these excess deaths were from COVID-19. Uh, and the other, the other one third were probably related to delays in care, just related to the shelter in place and also the fact that people may not have had um, appointments or surgeries or other preventative health being done. So we know that there's other non-COVID related ripple effects of this pandemic. Uh, and, and we do want to um, focus on that as well, and I'll, and I'll spend some time at the end of my talk uh, uh, talking about that issue. Um, the largest percentage, percentages of increases were in Hispanic and Latino um, uh, populations in adults aged 25 to 44. So it's not the older, older folks. It's really middle-aged folks. It's really young people when you think about 25 to 44. That's relatively young uh, adults. Uh, and so that's very concerning for all of us, that this is a disease that is claiming lives and it's claiming lives in ways that are quite alarming uh, along, um, along racial um, and, and age-based trends. Next slide. Um, we already know a lot about how COVID sickens us. Like I said, this is very basic and we've, you've heard us say this over and over. This is when people say they, they have coronavirus fatigue. I think they're sick of hearing about these safety messages, but it's really important to know that we have learned a lot about how this disease is spread. Uh, we know that when people don't wear masks that they can spread droplets uh, as far as six feet uh, away from them. Uh, we know that surfaces can harbor um, fomites, uh, which can also lead to spread. And that also guides um, a lot of the safety messaging that we are still uh, really um, uh, heavily pounding uh, on is because, because we know how it spreads, we have a, an opportunity to beat the spread and really outsmart this, this bug. Uh, let's keep going. Uh, many cases are preventable with low cost steps. So again, you know, I think all of us are waiting for that vaccine and certainly the, the best and brightest minds in the world are, are working on that. But before we have the vaccine, before we have these large trials, um, with expensive medications that, that can uh, beat the infection, we actually have very preventable, low cost steps that we can be instituting right now. So I really like these graphics that just show you that wearing a mask, uh, especially if both people wear a mask, that really lessens the risk of spread to a very low level. Um, you can consider a hotspot anywhere that has a crowded place, indoors where no masks are being worn. So that's a really high, highly dangerous spot. Um, whereas if masks are being worn, if things are done outdoors, if people are spacing themselves at least six feet apart, that's a safe spot. And so that I think is a very, very great graphic. This is, if you understand this, you really have gone a long way towards prevention and mitigation of this infection. Next slide. Uh, keep going. Um, we also know that contact tracing works. Um, uh, we'll, we're going to get into tracing and some of the plans that we have around that, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time, uh, but just, just knowing that this is a new term for us. Uh, I think none of us knew what contact tracing was a year ago, but now all of us are very intimately familiar with the concept, if not the actual operations. But we'll explain more about our specific contact tracing plans here in the county. Next slide. Some people have more health risks, so we've also discovered 
that people with comorbid conditions, which are represented in the green boxes here, um, tend to be uh, overrepresented in the number of fatalities, regardless of what age you're looking at. So this is a graph of all of the fatalities here in Fresno County. And you can see that um, comorbid conditions are represented in almost all of the different groups across the ages. So we have to work to protect people. Um, this is a picture of a typical interaction. And you can, um, you can imagine that either one of these people may have an immunocompromising condition. Uh, we have healthcare workers that have diabetes, um, high blood pressure, um, lupus, uh, other immunocompromising conditions. Some of them um, have been diagnosed with malignancy. And obviously all of these are diseases that affect the general population. And those are the people that we really do worry about is that even really common comorbid conditions like diabetes and high blood pressure um, are overrepresented whenever you look at um, uh, who actually dies and gets hospitalized uh, with this illness. Next slide. And that's what this shows um, is that um, the, the percentage of COVID deaths um, uh, by comorbidity, um, we basically track all of this as a part of our epidemiological analysis. Uh, and there's a big disparity among the, the, the racial makeup of the fatalities. Um, that um, the people that um, uh, are, are Hispanic uh, or non-Hispanic, Asian and Black, uh, tend to have a higher number of um, uh, patients that are relatively young, under age 64, uh, and also have comorbidities. Um, and so that, that's really important because these racial disparities reflect um, what's already out there. I mean, you know, COVID didn't cause these things, but it is exploiting um, the fact that uh, race and ethnicity and underlying medical conditions and access to care are all playing a role um, in how COVID affects different populations. Um, and, and, and we're, we're going to talk more about how we're addressing that as part of our response uh, through things like the equity metric that the state has introduced. Uh, next slide. So hospitals and clinics have had to adjust. Um, so again, uh, you, you know, every single hospital, the hospital where I have medical privileges, community regional medical center, uh, has a lot of different tents and other procedures to keep people safe. Here's an intubation box that we never had to use before COVID. And now this is just part of, of the usual procedures um, where we really try to minimize the risk to all of our staff whenever they're doing these procedures. So there's a lot of adjusting that has to be done and that continues to be done. We're, we're living in kind of a new normal where um, all of us are prepared and almost bracing for uh, more news to come down the line. Um, as tired as, all we, as we all are, we understand that we're not done learning about this infection and we're definitely not done learning about the best ways we can prevent and protect people against this infection. So all of us really have our feelers out about the best evidence and research whenever it comes to health and safety, especially in our, in our medical facilities where we know um, the most critical patients will need to be treated. Uh, and whenever there's a surge, there can be dozens or hundreds of those patients that are hospitalized in these hospitals um, that we have in, in Fresno County. Next slide. Um, flu and wildfires may worsen COVID outcomes. Uh, so, you know, we do ask people to stay outdoors, uh, but we know that air quality can um, confound people's plans to be outdoors. Um, same thing with influenza. Uh, we're really um, uh, messaging a lot about flu vaccine this year. Uh, because we really don't want those two epidemics to converge uh, because that will that will make everything harder. And so we know that these are confounders that we also have to deal with uh, in the context of our COVID-19 response. Next slide. So I think of all of these, putting them together, I know that that's a lot of gloom and doom. The next part of my remarks will be uh, hopefully a little bit uh, brighter, uh, but I really think of COVID as the tip of an iceberg. Um, and, and really the, the, the major part of the iceberg is really all of these other perhaps chronic and long, long simmering issues that have been brought to light uh, it, through the lens of COVID. Um, and so a focus on equity can help address the root causes. I really feel like our strategic plan is really a multi-pronged approach to help deal with all of these different issues that we've encountered as barriers uh, to effectively mitigating the spread of this, this infection. Um, and and that, that includes things like untreated or untreated chronic health issues, seasonal risks, 
uh, workforce shortages within and beyond healthcare, uh, economic fragility, which might lead to risky work practices, and then obviously the knowledge gaps. And unfortunately, a lot of the misinformation that we're trying to fight every single day related to um, uh, how to protect people uh, against coronavirus. Next slide. So um, we've developed a multi-pronged response. Um, part of that is making sure that all of our workplaces and congregate settings and schools stay as safe as possible. Um, and the rest of it is, is really going to be discussed by my colleagues. Uh, and you can see that it really is a well-detailed multi-pronged response, uh, which includes um, initiatives related to testing and contact tracing and prevention and supporting um, uh, people uh, who need to isolate and quarantine away from their families. Uh, those are all really important aspects of the response. Um, and I'm, I'm very proud of our team. And, and really, I have to give um, great compliments to Dave Pomaville for his leadership throughout this process in, in just thinking far forward about all of the elements that have to be in place. Um, I think that um, uh, a lot of the investment that we put into the partnerships and the stakeholders that we identified early um, have paid off and that we've had some many successes actually related to our multifaceted, multi-pronged response. Next slide. So everyone has a role to play. Um, you know, I, I'm very optimistic that we are going to conquer COVID um, and, and, I, and I need everyone to be on the conquer COVID team. So you can help us. Um, you can, um, again, hopefully all of these fundamentals that I've shared um, are not um, beyond um, a general person's understanding. Um, and, and we really um, are trying to craft messages and really try to make this as relatable as possible. Um, we're uh, dedicated to transparency. Um, we're, we're sharing uh, the data as we understand it as fast as we can. Uh, and we're trying to be as responsive as possible to all of our partners as issues come up. Um, but we, we also um, have an ask, which is that everyone has a role to play um, and you can help us um, by, um, by making sure that um, you have credible information to share out. Uh, and if you have suggestions or feedback about how we can work better, uh, that, that, um, that you relay that to us as well. Thank you. Next slide. Um, we will reopen. Um, you know, a lot of people ask, when will we return to normal? Uh, I would say that um, reopening is going to be gradual um, and, and we're going to reopen gradually and um, uh, not uh, all at once. Uh, so that that's one aspect of the blueprint uh, that I think everyone needs to internalize. As you can see, this is the state of California today. There's um, counties that are in purple. Um, there's counties that are in red, such as Fresno County. There's other counties that have entered into orange and yellow, um, which are the different tiers of restriction. So we were, we're very optimistic that we will move through all of these tiers, um, but it is going to take time um, and it's going to uh, require more patience of us, uh, even though we've, we've all certainly been very patient throughout this process. Um, in terms of Fresno County, just to give you a heads up, you're probably going to see these numbers again later uh, today. Uh, but we are still considered in substantial um, spread, an area of substantial spread, meaning that some non-essential indoor businesses are open, but they have to be done so with modifications. Um, in terms of cases per day, um, our uh, actual cases per day are 6.0, but they've adjusted that up to 6.5, uh, and that's because we're not doing enough testing. Uh, and that's really one takeaway is that we really need to encourage more testing so that we don't get um, penalized for, for that metric. Um, in terms of our positivity rate, uh, we're still in the red tier um, uh, at 5.1. Uh, however, our equity metric, which is really the, um, the lowest quartile of the Healthy Places Index within Fresno County, uh, the positivity rate there is 7.4, so it's higher than the rest of the county. And, and we're going to explain exactly what that means whenever we talk about the equity metric. But just keep in mind that these are the three metrics that we really have to pay attention to in order to get to our uh, orange uh, tier, which is what we should all be uh, dreaming and thinking about and planning for. That's why I wore my orange tie today. Um, and basically, uh, that is the cases per day, the positivity rate, and also the equity metric uh, all have to meet um, those requirements in order for us to reopen even more than we are currently able to do in the red tier. Next slide. So in terms of health department orders, you know, beyond what the state has done, I'm very proud of my team because 
we've been able to um, uh, approve some health department orders, which I think will really help with some of the needs uh, for Fresno County. Um, first, we've asked all of our primary care doctors to offer COVID-19 testing. Uh, next, we've asked our schools to go through all of the processes that the state has put out in terms of allowing openings. Sometimes those are through waivers for elementary schools. Other times those are using cohort guidances uh, so that they can limit the numbers of students that are coming together. Uh, but mostly it's really just waiting until we've been in red long enough to do in-person instruction safely. And then there's a whole bunch of other safety checks and balances that need to be um, implemented for schools to open up. And so you're gonna be hearing more about that whenever we talk about school reopenings. Um, but we are also asking them to conduct surveillance testing. Um, thirdly, um, if people are symptomatic or COVID positive, they have to isolate. Um, that's not just a recommendation, that's an order um, that we've got on the books. Um, and the close contacts of that individual, unless they're um, uh, essential workers, they must quarantine and stay home as much as possible except for essential uh, needs, um, including essential work. Uh, employers must also screen workers um, and support isolation and quarantine orders, uh, which means that they have to cooperate with public health in order to do outbreak investigations um, and share information um, as quickly as possible. Um, to help limit the spread. So all of those are really designed to help us create layers of protection so that we can protect the most number of people possible. Um, and that's what all of those orders are, are designed to do. Uh, we also, also get questions about testing sites. Uh, hopefully you have a good idea of where to go, but if you don't, then these are two good links that point you in the right direction um, about the kinds of testing that's available in Fresno County. Uh, the UCSF Fresno um, uh, program has the COVID Equity Project, and we have um, dozens and dozens of other clinics and, and providers and partners that we're working with that are offering COVID testing. And also your own primary care doctor um, is now uh, mandated to offer COVID testing. So we're working with all of our primary care doctors to make sure that they are able to do that um, with, with a minimum of hassle. Next slide. Lastly, I want to end on this note um, and, and just remind everyone that, you know, public health still has a day job. So even though we, we seem to be all about COVID all the time, remember that the Department of Public Health, um, you know, exists for a reason. Uh, and th those reasons um, uh, didn't go away with coronavirus. In fact, in many ways, they got more complicated. And even though we don't we don't talk about this as much as we should, and we certainly don't get um, the kind of media attention um, that they probably deserve. Uh, just keep in mind that there are a lot of other public health needs um, that we really need to refocus on. Um, and, and we can't do that without our collaborators and our partners either. Um, and that includes um, uh, issues related to uh, maternal health and perinatal health uh, and, and keeping kids healthy. Um, you know, the health of the jail population, the homeless population, and migrant workers, all of whom are considered vulnerable populations, uh, ensuring that we have good continuity of care from the hospital to the primary care clinics, to the federally qualified health centers, uh, to a lot of the prevention and screening that we um, are asking our providers to partner with, um, substance use and substance disorders, and mental health and behavior health issues, um, have really um, uh, be become the focus um, of, of a lot of attention. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the progress that um, we had made related to things like substance use and substance disorders was put on hold. Um, so we're hoping to revisit that progress and really continue that good journey that we had people on to make sure that they are able to access recovery resources. Um, and then, uh, you, you know, basic things that public health does, which um, as an emergency physician and a, and a toxicologist um, really excited me to this position, um, relate to things like environmental health, um, uh, issues of air and water quality, uh, lead poisoning and, and prevention of lead poisoning, and then just keeping people safe with all of the business activities that go on, such as restaurant inspections and certifications for all of the different industries that are operating in Fresno County. These are all just kind of everyday jobs that public health is tasked with. And the reason you don't hear about them is that the department does such a great job on all of them that it doesn't really make the news. Um, we need to refocus on that. Um, we need to figure out ways to continue that progress, but do it in a way that's safe, that keeps our county employees safe, and at the same time, keeps the general public safe as well. 
but we need to, uh, um, I think, revisit a lot of those interactions that um, were the kind of the bread and butter things that public health was known for before coronavirus came along. Uh, and like I said, we're not going to be able to do any of those without strong collaborations with our community partners. Um, so I'll just end on that note um, to say that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. We are going to conquer COVID together and we'll have lots more work to do, but we'll do it as a team. Here's more um, information sites if you need them. Um, and I think that's the end of my remarks. So thank you all so much. Uh, I hope you're able to stay safe, stay kind uh, and, and conquer COVID. Um, these are actually horses that were rescued from the Creek Fire and they were being housed at the Fresno Fairgrounds when I visited. So just to give you, a, I guess, a note of, of positivity and optimism to end this, this, this part of the talk, um, just remember we can, we can get through anything if we work together. Thank you. And I think we will pass it on to Dr. Zweifler, um, who will talk about COVID-19 testing strategies. Well, thank you, thank you very much, very Dr. Bora. And, and I'm hearing a hearing bit of an bit echo, of here. echo here, but um, um, as Dr. As Boris said, said, this has been a very dynamic uh, uh, epi uh, pandemic. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, progress. Uh, uh, a lot has happened during the past six months. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, 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 a lot of progress as well in testing. Uh, my colleague David Lucchini says that. Uh, that whatever we say is is uh, we need to timestamp it. So uh, just keep that in mind that what we say today will probably be will will probably be yesterday's news uh, very shortly. Uh, but I did want to touch on what's going on with testing. Uh, talk about uh, some of the reasons that we do test. Uh, go over a few of the tests uh, that we have available, and then think about how that plays out in terms of our testing strategies. Uh, so first, the first category of, of patients that we really want to make sure get tested are those that are symptomatic. Uh, so there is a wide range of symptoms that are associated with with COVID. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard them. The most common one actually is fever. It's about 70 to 80 percent of individuals who have COVID will have a fever, uh, but also cough, uh, shortness of breath. If you have shortness of breath or you know someone who's short of breath, they need to go to the hospital to get evaluated. Uh, but there's also a range of other symptoms that are that are very common uh, that can be associated with other conditions as well. So things like headaches, myalgias, fatigue are also symptoms of uh, of uh, COVID. Uh, Dr. Vora mentioned that there was a health officer order that says if you're symptomatic that uh, that um, uh, that you need to isolate. Uh, one caveat to that that is particularly important as we're talking about testing uh, is that if you are symptomatic uh, and then but test negative, then you are not uh, then you can end your isolation period once your symptoms resolve. So uh, uh, this, the category of symptomatic individuals is a, is a very important one to have testing. Uh, one of the real challenges with uh, COVID is that not only are, uh, can symptomatic individuals transmit the, the infection, but also when you're asymptomatic, you can transmit the infection. Uh, so uh, th uh, that's why uh, we need to preach universal precautions that we're always doing, the, uh, uh, um, maintaining six feet of social distancing, always wearing our masks, avoiding those large groups. So just uh, uh, assuming that anyone can have, uh, that we come in contact could, uh, could be, uh, could have COVID and that we could have COVID and potentially transmit it to others, uh, even when we're asymptomatic. Uh, so, uh, but with our asymptomatic populations, uh, uh, we really want to have an understanding of, uh, of, of, of the community spread. Uh, so there's a couple ways we, we can look at that. Uh, one is by looking at populations. So an example of that would be the surveillance that we're, that we're putting in place with our school systems uh, uh, to look uh, systematically at that 10% that of, 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 of uh, 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 personnel in our in the different schools uh, to see to see uh, uh, what is the prevalence in our community. Uh, the other way that we uh, screen for that we can uh, check for asymptomatic individuals uh, is through the screening options that are available through sites like OptumServe. Uh, so uh, uh, this is something that's available to everyone uh, and is a more of a random kind of uh, 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 evaluation of, of of what's happening in our community. Uh, a third way that we can look at, at, at testing is to focus on high risk individuals. So you can be high risk for COVID either uh, uh, 
uh, uh, because of uh, where you live or, or because of, uh, of your uh, of conditions. Uh, Dr. Vora mentioned uh, comorbid conditions like diabetes, hypertension, uh, uh, chronic heart failure, uh, but you also uh, can be at risk because of where you are and what you're doing. Uh, so if you're working in a meatpacking factory or some of our agricultural workers where you're close to others, uh, you're at increased risk. Uh, if you're living in a skilled nursing facility, if you're in jail, uh, homeless shelters where you're in congregate settings, you're also at high risk. Uh, and even um, uh, uh, our, our colleges, residential colleges and our sports teams are example of, of uh, high risk activities. So that's another uh, a, a group to consider in addition, uh, kind of a subset of our asymptomatic population uh, in addition to our symptomatic patients. Next slide. So what are some of the tests that we have available? Uh, well, the, uh, uh, the one that is considered the gold standard is the PCR test. Uh, what a PCR test is, it, is it's testing for the, for the uh, COVID-19 DNA. Uh, it's a, uh, uh, again, it's considered the gold standard. So it's the one where if there's any question, we, we turn to the, to the PCR test. Uh, it can take a few days to get back. So there have uh, been some, uh, so uh, there's uh, issues with delay in, in results, which can be problematic uh, 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 in that uh, people can continue doing their, their normal activities, which is why uh, uh, Dr. Vora said in the health officer order that while you're waiting a test uh, that you should be, uh, if you're symptomatic, you, sh you, should, you should continue to isolate. Uh, PCR tests are also, uh, uh, interesting in that they can remain positive for quite some time. So uh, what what we see is that you generally will will become positive a couple days before you actually become symptomatic, uh, but you can can remain positive for 10, 20, 30, even uh, even longer uh, uh, after uh, after uh, you um, uh, after your infectious period begins. Uh, so for that reason, we don't. Uh, routinely recommend getting a PCR test to determine when your infection period ends. Instead, we say you isolate for 10 days uh, and until your, um, your symptoms have resolved and you're fever free for one day. Uh, so we, we, we clear people based on symptoms as opposed to requiring PCR testing to clear, to clear individuals. Uh, another type of test you probably heard a lot about is the uh, antigen test. So this test for a, uh, a piece of the virus uh, uh, but not the DNA, uh, and uh, th it's a more readily available test uh, and uh, and le less expensive. Uh, so there's some um, uh, th there's some positive aspects to it. Um, there, it's not quite as sensitive uh, or as specific uh, as the uh, PCR test. So you run into problems with false positives and false negatives, uh, and. Uh, uh, that we probably need to hold that discussion for another for another day. Uh, then finally, there's the antibody test. So when your body, uh, when there's an infection in your in in the body, uh, your body creates antibodies to attack the pathogen. Uh, and so the you can measure these antibodies, and you can measure specifically the antibodies for uh, uh, for COVID. And uh, uh, the it, this is a test that we really have not utilized much at present. Uh, perhaps as we uh, have a vaccine, we may want to screen first for the antibody to see who really needs it. Uh, there's questions about the antibody test as well in terms of how long uh, your immune response will still be detectable and how long it's actually effective. So uh, we, it really has not played a major role uh, yet in terms of our uh, response to the, uh, uh, to, to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so the PCR test, I mentioned that it can take several days to get back, which, which has been problematic, uh, the, but there are several rapid tests as well. So the, uh, we have rapid tests for both the PCR, but particularly for the rapid antigen tests. And uh, so that's, a, that's an important development. Uh, another, uh, when we're thinking about testing, uh, we can also, another variable is the type of specimens that are used. 
So uh, uh, Dr. Vora had a, a picture of someone getting uh, getting tested and swabbed with a nasopharyngeal uh, swab, which is not particularly pro uh, pleasant. Uh, it's also problematic because you have to have uh, uh, PPE. The, the person who's collecting it has to have PPE, which is expensive and difficult and cumbersome uh, and, has and has discouraged uh, more uh, widespread uh, uh, testing uh, uh, for, um, with the nasopharyngeal swabs. Uh, fortunately, we now have uh, 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 nasal, anterior nasal swabs that can be self-collected, and this is really beneficial because uh, then the the office does not have to um, wear the PPE when they're collecting it. Uh, and finally, there's a, a saliva testing you may have heard about. Uh, uh, it is not as readily available as the nasopharyngeal and the anterior nasal swabs, uh, but I suspect we'll be hearing more about it in the future. Uh, and we'll also be hearing more about the ability to pull tests to, to uh, do surveillance on larger populations, which you can do with uh, uh, either the, the nasal swabs or the saliva. Uh, next slide. So uh, how does this all play out? Uh, well, uh, uh, first of all, uh, the as we think about the populations we want to serve uh, and the uh, various type of tests that are available, uh, uh, it has implications for our testing sites. Uh, so for example, our medical offices, Dr. Vora mentioned there's a health officer order requiring primary care offices to offer uh, testing. Uh, so what our medical offices mainly are going to see are patients who are symptomatic. If you're sick, you go see your doctor. Uh, so it's really important that, uh, that we have access to testing there. Uh, fortunately, the rapid antigen testing uh, is most, is most uh, accurate when it's done in the symptomatic period. So that's a really good test to offer uh, in, our, in our medical offices. Uh, but we also want to be able to, to ensure that our medical offices can screen individuals uh, who may be uh, in a high risk occupation or in contact with someone uh, who are asymptomatic. Uh, and fortunately, again, now that we have more access to the anterior nasal swabs, it's much easier for our medical offices to provide uh, that the, the PCR testing uh, with the anterior nasal swab so we can screen both asymptomatic as well as symptomatic event, uh, individuals in our medical offices. Uh, that we, uh, 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 we are partnering with any number of, of, of federally qualified health centers to do events. Uh, this is uh, helpful in that it can address some of these health equity issues and make sure that we're getting out to communities that need it. Uh, these are mainly going to be asymptomatic individuals, so here we're looking more at PCR testing. Uh, in the past, we've relied on uh, the OptumServe. Uh, that it's a, it, this is less of a kind of a systematic approach to, to screening and surveillance in our community. Uh, so it's great that we're going to have increased access to uh, for testing through medical offices and kind of um, targeted uh, targeted events uh, in communities of, of need, uh, and then some of the surveillance at the schools to get a better sense of, of what's uh, uh, the prevalence in our communities. Uh, these tests also have impact on our uh, different metrics, which I think we'll hear more about. Uh, but um, certainly, the the case rates as we uh, have as we're screening more people uh, who are symptomatic and requiring that, we're going to probably identify more cases. Uh, with one kind of in the weeds issue is the rapid antigen testing is not currently uh, counted as a positive by the state. Uh, but I hope that we don't let the tail wag the dog and that we really design our systems, our, our testing strategies to be as efficient and effective as possible. Uh, we also, looking at the percent positivity, we talked about our high risk groups. If you're screening high risk groups, you're more likely to, to um, and you're doing more symptomatic individuals, your percent positivity is, gonna, is probably going to go up. Uh, but, you know, again, I think, you know, um, uh, putting our resources where they're most important, where they're most likely to uh, be beneficial uh, it is important to keep that in mind. And then, of course, the health equity issue by using our events to really target those communities, I think we can uh, make a major uh, impact. So just to summarize, uh, we um, uh, have uh, better tools. We have better tests. I think we're doing a better job of targeting our, our testing to, to communities of need and to uh, symptomatic individuals. Uh, but I, we cannot uh, test ourselves out of this uh, pandemic. Uh, so maintaining universal precautions, the masking, the social distancing is really going to be critical. Uh, and to echo what Dr. Bora said, uh, uh, the the pandemic has has brought us together with our community partners. 
uh, and I think we can continue to build on uh, and uh, build on that with co cooperating and collaborating on other major issues, uh, including things like addressing social determinants of health in the future. Uh, so with that, I'll stop and uh, uh, thank you for letting me be part of this uh, presentation. Thank you, Dr. Zweifler, and thank you so much for all the work that you've been doing with us um, over the last uh, few months. You've been a great addition to our team, and we really uh, look forward to being able to uh, work with you more as we do implement a lot of these programs that we think are going to be sustainable uh, as we go, um, you know, as we conquer COVID and move on to solving some of the other big health issues we have in our community. We wanted to have um, Mary Morrison talk. She's been uh, primarily focused on the case investigation and contact tracing, and uh, she's been a great resource for us here within the department. And so Mary's going to share her thoughts. Hi, everybody. I'm um, glad to have this opportunity to talk about what we've been doing um, since the beginning of this year, really. Um, go ahead, next slide, please. So we've certainly come a long way from our, our initial response. Um, in February, we had a small group of individuals who were monitoring uh, people who were coming back from other countries, so our returning traveler monitoring. And primarily, this was individuals that already had done some work in uh, case investigation from our communicable disease investigation program and STD programs. Um, we recognized really early that we needed to expand our program, our work around um, case investigations and contact tracing. Um, the two big things that we started with was answering lots of calls uh, from the public and providers and then the monitoring. And so we knew that we need to expand those areas. And so in that in that process, we developed our provider line, which is an ongoing uh, line. It's a basically a call center that um, our team answers questions and calls from the public and providers related to COVID. The second really big uh, component was our medical investigation team. And this is really our, you know, what everybody knows is contact tracing. The medical investigation team are individuals to do investigation on positive COVID cases. And we have trained a number of people from, uh, from a variety of, of programs and divisions and some extra help staff um, to do that particular work. During the spring, we recognized that there was some, some areas that we really needed to spend some focused time on. And those were the individuals that were working in the food industry, so manufacturing and distribution and ag, and those that were living uh, or working in a congregate setting, such as skilled nursing facilities, assisted living, and the jail. So out of that came our CSMIT, our Congregate Setting Medical Investigation Team, and our Facility Liaison Team. And those, the individuals that are working on those teams specifically focus on uh, businesses who are are in those uh, particular arenas and primarily provide education for prevention of further exposure of, uh, and spread of COVID, but also manage outbreaks in those particular facilities. Uh, early on in our response, um, many of you may have heard the term just in time training, and that's what we were doing. We were pulling people in from different divisions and we were pulling people in from other departments and we were doing a just in time training. And it was really about 40 minutes for us to tell people a little bit about case investigation, show them our database that we were going to be working in, and then gave them cases to people to call and to be able to, uh, to do an investigation on. Um, as I said earlier, this was really a challenging time because only about 10 or so people had ever done any case investigation. So there was a lot of training that was involved in that. Out of that process, our uh, training and onboarding team uh, came about. And again, it was about 40 minutes early on, and it's now a four day training that really gives people the foundation for case investigation, which we really feel can, can carry us in other aspects that we might use um, case investigators or contact tracing. They've been really integral in, in the development of all the materials that we have for training, the adaptation of those, and then the training of actual teams. Uh, with the ongoing evaluation of our workflows, we determined that because of the number of cases that we had, we had to pull out our contact tracing, which is contact to people who are under quarantine or have had exposure to a positive case from our medical investigation team. And so we've developed a team that specifically deals with those individuals who would need to be quarantined. Um, also, during that period of time, we uh, recognized that we needed a team that could call um, individuals and check in to see whether or not they've recovered already and to know, see if they were interested in donating plasma and so then linking them to the California Blood Center. 
Our most recent team is our ASMIT or academic settings team, and this team is focused on the school settings. Um, they're working with the schools from K through 12, universities, colleges, and some daycares. Um, it really expands or decreases with what the need is. And so we're really excited about this team. We've hired a number of individuals to help it, help the team. They are being trained right now, and they're going to be working specifically with the schools for uh, providing education and managing uh, cases, even if they only have one case, and outbreaks in those particular um, settings. As with all the work around operations that have happened over the last eight or so 10 months, uh, we continue to adapt and add teams to manage specific challenges in our communities. We have worked with our homeless population, and I believe that Dewan is going to speak to that a little bit, um, but we don't know what the next thing is. So we're always trying to jump ahead of it and figure out what, what team do we need to deal with whatever next is going to come. Each one of these teams, they really work together. They, we don't work in a silo. Each program doesn't work in a silo. They're all working together. Um, they collaborate together, and they they are really a tremendous team of individuals who are working to, to both educate our public and stop the spread of COVID. Next slide, please. Um, we certainly had some challenges, and I'm, I'm really, I, when I saw the slide that Dr. Vora put on, I was really pleased to see that si slide because it really shows the example of what was happening during the summer with cases. Um, we a number of things that were really challenging in the in the spring and summer of this year is that we were having a delay in lab results. It was taking seven plus days to get results and sometimes even longer. Um, there were a lot of cases and we just simply did not have enough of staff to be able to get to a call to each one of those individuals in a really timely manner. Um, and because of that, our, you know, there was a lot of changes of what we were doing. And so there were challenges with our training and onboarding team. They simply didn't have enough time to train the individuals that we were trying to get onboarded. And because we went from a 40 minute just in time training to a four day pretty comprehensive training, the four days is, is the foundation and that extends. And so there's a lot of mentoring that goes with it. So when we had trainings each and every week, it was really challenging for them to be able to meet the needs of our new staff. And then as um, you know, Dr. Vora also mentioned, the, the other issues that are happening in the health department did not stop, and but our response required pulling individuals from our other divisions to assist with uh, and support our COVID uh, response. Um, so I'm happy to say, I'm gonna share some of our, the things that are going really well, but those were some of the challenges that were happening in the spring and the summer of this year. Um, we've got some really good strengths, and so we're excited about what, where we are now and where we're going to be moving uh, going forward. We've really been done really well in being able to identify individuals who are in higher risk uh, populations and then developing specialized teams, particularly our ASMIT, which is our newest team, our academic setting teams. We've been working on that for a number of months and getting individuals trained and really working on uh, and how do we support our schools um, with their COVID response? How do we support them in managing the number of students that they may have? And so there's a lot of work that's gone around that in, in developing what we call a line list to be able to send it to them, make it easier for them to manage their data and for us to as well. We have a lot of standardized training and onboarding materials for all of our new staff, and that process is going really well. We've also added members to our um, training and onboarding team to be able to support them and to get those individuals back to their regular programs so that they can go about the normal work of, of mostly, they're mostly public health nurses doing the work that the department um, that we're called to do. Um, lots of cross training in medical investigation, contact tracing, academic settings and congregate settings so that there's that individuals can work in different components of the response. So if the, there's an increased need in uh, CSMIT, then we are able to pull individuals with just some minimal uh, changes to what they might be doing. They, they're able to pull into that area. Um, so a lot of cross trainings that have, have happened. We've done a lot of collaboration with our CBOs and our FQHCs, and so we're looking forward to some of the things that are happening with that. One of the things that I'm really proud of is that we're being able to enter, uh, sign, and initiate investigation within 24 hours right now. And during the, the difficult months during the summer, we uh, readapted or adapted our training, uh, excuse me, our investigation materials to be able to, you know, to reach the highest risk population and get those highest risk questions asked. So um, it's really exciting to be able to get those cases assigned and investigated, um, the initiation of investigation in such a short period of time. We also recently um, have improved the health officer orders. We have a new one out that came out a couple of weeks ago and some standardization of language. So I think that that's a huge benefit. And also with our testing health officer order that Dr. Vora uh, explained and talked about, um, we've got some really well-trained staff and we've hired some individuals to return um, our, our other public health nursing, particularly public health nurses, back to their regular roles. And so we've got some new staff that are coming on to take um, responsibility in those lead roles. And so we're excited to see what's gonna happen with that. Next slide. 
And we've had lots of partnerships over the last few months. Um, in the spring and early summer, we had a partnership with American Ambulance who was do doing contact investigation. We've trained some of our city of Fresno staff. We still have a number of staff from the Fresno County Superintendent of Schools that's doing contact tracing and medical, medical investigation. Uh, we have the collaborations with our community-based organizations and FQHCs. We've done a number of trainings for our school district nurses, so they have a foundation of what uh, medical investigation and contact tracing is and an understanding of our isolation and quarantine orders. And we have ongoing collaboration with schools and universities. What we really know over the last uh, few months is that um, we have to adapt. And so we continue to do that. We continue to evaluate each of our processes. We adjust and we grow as the need arises. Thank you, Mary. Um, you know, and I, I think it's been very challenging, you know, to go from an environment where you were, you know, having to wait in some cases weeks to get um, case investigations going. It must, it must feel much better to where you're able to get in touch with people inside of 24 hours. Um, uh, it, it really does. The, the work that the team has done to get to be able to contact individuals and really get the um, case investigation done and, and to let people know what those next steps are and, and how do we support individuals that, that need to be isolated or quarantined. It, it's a really, it's a great thing. And we've added a lot of pieces to our to our um, assessment, um, including what kind of resources individuals need. And so we want to be able to support, support the community as best we can. Thank you, Mary. Thanks for all the work you and your team are doing. Absolutely. So I think we wanted to talk for a few minutes about the response to um, people experiencing homelessness. And Duan Utech, the Director of Behavioral Health is on, along with Sonia De La Rosa. She's a principal analyst with the County Administrative Office. I think we've referred to her in the slide as within the Department of Behavioral Health. I think she pretty much uh, is, is working for one or the other um, pretty much full time. And we, we I, I personally want to thank both of them for the work they've done on this. I I can remember um, very early on during this incident and I just went to Dewan and said, can you pick up the homeless group and go? And she did and has done a phenomenal job and our teams have worked together very well. And uh, we're lucky to have her in the community and glad to have her um, talking today. So welcome both of you. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, it was actually um, the day we did our first press conference um, declaring an emergency that you asked me to take the lead, but I could not do this without Sonia. So the first person I called after you asked me was Sonia. Um, and uh, so together we've been tackling this. Um, I will briefly talk a little bit about the Department of Behavioral Health's response. Um, I've said this many times that if you had asked me um, in early March how long it would take us to shift to a telehealth service, I would have told you probably a year and a half to two years, and we were able to accomplish it in a few weeks. I know that um, that's a common refrain from many of you as well who've had to um, Zoom and um, Teams and all kinds of different ways to uh, reach the people that we serve. And so, our department is still challenged with that. We are still seeing people in person who need medication administration um, as well as assessments and such. And we are constantly looking for ways to um, create new spaces for people who need in-person services. We have seen an increase in uh, particularly youth in crisis. Um, and so we're also looking at expanding both capacity within our inpatient psychiatric facility known as STARS, um, Central Star Adolescent Psychiatric Health Facility. That's our 24-7 inpatient facility on the Kings Canyon campus, as well as our crisis stabilization unit. So it's a fluid process, um, constantly looking at ways to continue to meet the needs of the people we serve. And as Dr. Bora mentioned, also really keeping a close eye on substance use disorder. Um, some of the waivers that the government was able to provide to us were a little slower to come with substance use disorder. And so um, really working closely with our providers to ensure that access to services remains. Um, so with that, we'll move on to homelessness. I don't know who, oh, here we go. All right, so um, very quickly, Sonia and I brought together that day um, a group of people um, across our community that blessedly were already working together around these issues. Um, there is a continuum of care in the Fresno Madera area, and so many of the in, uh, entities on this slide 
um, were part of that. Um, and so we brought many, many people together to assist us in crafting strategies. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, and so what we did was we, we worked very quickly with um, some of those providers to identify new shelter space. And um, as you can imagine, with COVID, it could not be your typical congregate shelter space. That was at least our um, contention. And so we worked with some of our private and, and nonprofit um, providers to um, create several different locations where we could house individuals. And what we did was we went out um, to the street and did some surveys and asked people what it would take for them to agree to shelter. Um, and largely what you find is they want to be with people that they've lived with, they want ha to have their pets, and they want to have their possessions. So we tried to move people into shelter rooms that could accommodate those things. Um, and, and especially if there were several people who were um, living on the street together, we tried, tried to co-locate them um, to both meet their needs as well as maximize our ability to utilize the space available. And so the spaces that we identified were at the old Hacienda Hotel um, or resort, um, which was already being utilized for some substance use disorder residential treatment. And we um, had some other properties, um, a, a large um, home type situation, as well as the old comprehension, comprehensive addiction medicine program out on Whitesbridge Road. Um, and then the state made available what was called Project Room Key, which was some motels that they would pay for. And so what basically what we did with those was we crafted a strategy, an algorithm, if you will, um, where individuals who were suspected of having COVID either through um, symptoms or they were awaiting test results, um, we have housed in the hotel until such time as they are either symptom free per the guidelines or have a negative, had a negative test result that they turned out not to have COVID. And so um, that's worked pretty well, as well as some trailers that were made available, which I'll let Sonia talk a little bit about. And then Sonia will also talk about um, this graph that you see in front of you, which really details um, the number of individuals that we've sheltered. And she can talk about how we've utilized the trailers and some other supplies we've provided across the county, as well as some of the rural efforts. So Sonia, you want to take it from there? So good okay. afternoon and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dewan, for starting us off. So this graph that you have in front of you um, shows you how long we've had the beds in place. It's been from March to September. Um, we still continue to have them in place, but we wanted to capture a moment in time to show you what we started off with pretty much um, by about mid-March, we had almost 300 beds available and we were able to fill 238 by the end of that. Um, well, to begin with, I'm sorry, we filled 238 and by the end of March, we were already at 314 occupied and 335 added. Today, uh, we are at this 448 number uh, of total beds available and we have 367 occupied. Um, our range, our average has been about 400 individuals in the beds um, every month. So we've been capturing it from our service providers and trying to keep an update of, of the beds that we have available so that our outreach team can continue to bring people in that are ready for housing. If you can go on to the next slide. Now this gives you a listing of the, a little bit more information about the beds. We have 398 um, emergency beds that were added. This is a little different than the prior slide because we did lose a couple beds at about the middle of our, our because they transitioned to uh, mental health uh, beds, but we were also able to open um, beds. So the total loss was about 20 to 30 beds. Um, today we continue at almost capacity. These are the different sites that Dewan mentioned. We have CAP at 115, Hacienda at 96, the Flats at 37, Pavarillo provides 28 of those beds. Marjorie Mason Center uses a hotel and is able to house over 40 individuals. Um, Selma, we have Selma Com operating a hotel in the city of Selma with 60, uh, potential for 60 beds, but we usually are about 75 individuals at that site. And then we have Sanger, 
with 22 beds, and we're typically at about 26 to 28 individuals at that location. In addition, the California Office of Emergency Services did provide 20, 28 trailers. We placed three of those trailers in the county of Madera. The balance were placed here in the city of Fresno uh, metro area, the majority, and then we sent a couple over to Selma um, to be next to the hotel that's on site. These trailers are used primarily for isolation. In some instances, they have been used for quarantine as well, uh, but for the most part, it's people that have become in, um, symptomatic or may have been exposed will be placed in these trailers. And if needed, they would be transferred to one of our hotels for isolation and quarantine once, if they were to be tested or um, confirmed positive or test negative, but still symptomatic, they would stay at the hotels. So the six isolation and quarantine rooms are actually our hotel locations. At one time, we were actually at about 30 hotel rooms. So we have the opportunity to adjust based on what's going on in our community. Right now, we have six rooms secured, but if we needed to next week, we can go up to those 30 again. And we rely heavily on our existing shelters, our partners, Paparillo House, Evangel Home, Marjorie Mason Center, uh, Fresno Rescue Mission, uh, also locations operated by Turning Point um, and supported by many of our Fresno Continuum of Care providers. Um, have helped us to bring people into housing, but also to bring them into the existing beds that we had available within the community. We did provide, and we continue to provide pro personal protective equipment to these existing shelters and the new beds that, that were added. We also provide it to our outreach team and anybody that is interacting with our homeless population. And we try to have um, additional supplies go out to them monthly or as needed. And we also stationed hand washing stations and sanitizer stations next to our service providers and um, shelter providers and just generally areas that are visited by a, a larger amount of people. In the rural community, we actually stationed some next to city halls and worked with the uh, cities to see where else they might need to have them stationed where individuals frequent quite often. And those are funded with the County of Fresno, uh, through the County of Fresno and through the City of Fresno and also the Continuum of Care. We, to keep our, our shelter safe, um, we did schedule disinfection cleaning. So we do have um, weekly uh, disinfection coming into the shelters to make sure everything is, is cleaned fairly, you know, disinfected. And we also do the same with the hotel locations. Whenever anybody exits, we do go in there and disinfect the site and make it ready for another individual if it's needed. And with regard to surveillance testing, as Dr. Swifler mentioned, we do work with our service providers and shelter operators to schedule surveillance testing. Right now, we started off with about 10% testing. Now we're at about 20% testing. And that just gives us an idea of, of you know, what the testing um, is at the shelters and what other um, support we could provide to them. So we work very closely with the Department of Public Health and also our federally qualified health centers as well as UC SF's um, Fresno. Our outreach teams, we have one in the metro area and one in the rural area. And anytime we are made aware of an encampment, we do have our outreach team go out and engage with individuals, offer them housing, uh, offer them beds that are available, but also offer them services. Many just need to be connected back to services and that is what's done um, daily. And we connect also with local law enforcement and the smaller communities to make sure that we are reaching out to individuals all the time. With the telemedicine and behavioral health referrals, um, when COVID, the COVID beds were made operational, we realized that we needed to have an ability for our uh, folks to be able to connect with their doctors and be able to um, have access to their medication. In addition, there's a few individuals that maybe needed the behavioral um, health services. So a referral was actually created by the Department of Behavioral Health to um, allow shelter operators to refer individuals directly to services. And again, we work very collaboratively with the Department of Behavioral Health. Um, the next slide. And here's an algorithm that Dewan will be able to cover um, regarding uh, individuals that are entering into our system. Yeah, so we created this algorithm to help um, identify where someone should go in the system um, that we described to you. Um, there is a, a bit of 
objectivity to where we place people um, and also how they should be monitored while they're there. Um, and so we use this algorithm for that. We also have a separate guideline for use of PPE. Um, I will mention that we are we are pivoting now to also um, attempt to get people um, vaccinated for the flu. So there's a significant effort there. And then the other thing that we're really focused on right now is um, with this, what we would consider a bit of a captive audience in the shelter. How do we facilitate them getting into permanent housing? Um, so my department has partnered with a, a couple of different entities and we're already working on some permanent supportive housing developments. Um, and we have one coming on in the next few months, but Project Home Key was um, another resource made available through the state. And um, I'm gonna let Sonia talk a little bit about Project Home Key. So most frequently, I'm gonna wait to see if, I, I don't think I'm live just yet, so. We can hear you. Okay, very good. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so just to give a quick update with regards to Home Key, um, and actually, if we can move on to the next slide, because this is part of what's been happening with our system. And just as Mary mentioned earlier, we've had to adapt as well. And as we've been um, going through this response, we've had to take a look at what we're doing and see how we can do it better. We've had to extend beds, something that we thought would last three months has lasted a lot longer. And then we've also had to um, look at different resources that are available both statewide and um, through the feds to the federal government. And so one of the things that became available through the state was home, uh, the home key, which allowed us to apply to renovate a hotel and provide permanent housing for individuals experiencing homelessness. The Fresno Housing Authority did the same um, in collaboration with the city of Fresno, and we are actually waiting to hear back on their award. We heard about ours, and we are gonna be able to convert 204 rooms into 160 permanent housing units. And what that's gonna allow us to do is actually move some of the individuals that are currently in our homeless system into more permanent housing and using rapid rehousing funds, we're going to be able to also provide case management with, to them. So as this uh, response continues, and uh, although it appears it may taper off at the end of December, it's actually going to be allowed, uh, able to allow us to transition people into more permanent housing and then open those beds that we have for emergency housing for individuals that are coming in off the street. And so, Home key is actually providing um, just significant number of, you know, this, the number of units that are being provided are 160, but we actually anticipate we'll probably house well over 200 individuals at that location. And I, be I believe that the um, the housing authority got their award too, right? Sonia, that was the award. So they received, they did receive one award and they have reservations on the other awards. We are just waiting for confirmation. So in total, um, Housing Authority received the one, I believe it was about 100 units that are gonna be trans, you know, once they're renovated, there'll be a less number. But um, at one time, I know Housing Authority was looking at well over 400 units to then um, create probably about 200 and, 200 and change um, permanent housing units. So that's what we're waiting to hear back from the state. And that's all the information I have. Um, Duan, did you have anything further? Nope. I don't know if there's any questions, but otherwise we're done. Yes. End thank of report. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you both very much um, for the presentation and the work you've been doing and, and uh, the respective staff that have been really working tirelessly to try to protect some of the most vulnerable populations that we, um, we work with. Um, we're going to shift to talking um, about the agriculture response and I wanted to introduce to everyone um, Dr. Trinidad Solis. She's uh, um, from the Valley and, and um, left to go to medical school and, and was in practice in Southern California and uh, wanted to return to the Valley. And um, we, we met a few, um, two or three months ago and we, we asked her and she agreed to come on and help us uh, with our uh, COVID response. And she's been doing a great job. I've asked her to work specifically um, with the agricultural community and um, primarily focusing on our, our farm workers. 
So she's going to give us an update from the ag community. Okay. Well, thank you for the introduction, Dave. Um, as Dave was saying, I did grow up in the valley, small town, Salma, and my father was a farm worker for 40 years in the Central Valley. So for, that's why um, helping farm workers is really close to my heart. And yeah, I joined the department to help coordinate our response regarding um, protecting farm workers against COVID. And I'm working closely with my colleague, Wayne Fox, who used to work with Environmental Health Division for over 30 years, and he's a farmer himself, and we're combining our backgrounds and expertise to better come up with solutions to coordinate our response. So yeah, let's get started. Next slide. Um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm using the definition from the Industrial Welfare Commission for agriculture workers. It's a definition that we use in our county for different ag programs. It's really uh, broad and it encompasses uh, individuals who work in the canning, uh, freezing and pres preserving industry, um, industries that handle products after harvest um, and then products for the market on the farm and similar agriculture occupations. So, I uh, just want to give examples like fruit packers, farm workers. Earlier this year, the uh, California Department of Public Health declared agricultural workers as essential critical infrastructure workers, which designates and highlights the importance of uh, our agricultural workforce and also the importance of um, keeping them healthy and safe. Um, in particular, I thought I wanted to share this number with you all that Fresno County has an estimated 50,000 to 70,000 farm workers working at any given time. And that's why myself and Wayne really focusing on this population um, in our efforts to prevent against COVID. But I'll mention in the next slides about other efforts we're doing for all of the ag industry. Next slide. So I'll start off by uh, talking about PPE, Personal Protective Equipment Distribution, in this case, MASS. So we've collaborated with the Fresno County Department of Agriculture, the Farm Bureau, and Nisi Farmers League to distribute PPE directly to farm workers and other ag employees. To date, Fresno County has given over 2 million masks and hand sanitizers to farm workers. And just wanted to specify, of those 2 million masks, about 500,000 of those masks were N95. And I bring this up because N95 not only help against COVID, but uh, as Dr. Vora mentioned earlier, that uh, due to the wildfires that's been happening in our um, near our region, that the air pollution has gotten worse. And so uh, there's a state mandate that when the air uh, quality and level gets worse, then employers are mandated to give their employees N95 masks. And so we've been helping employers meet that state mandate. So um, yeah, so I think that's very important to know that we have been helping giving them N95 masks. Next slide. And then workplace safety. I wanted to share our protocol that we've been doing to keep our ag businesses safe and also out in the fields. Um, I did want to highlight our staff, uh, Fresno County uh, staff member um, Tom Fuller. So he's really been our ag liaison for this, and he and his team um, take these steps whenever we have a, a positive um, COVID-19 positive individual. So usually um, we're notified uh, that someone, for example, tested positive in a um, company, an ad company. We request the information of, of the COVID-19 positive individual and their workplace contacts. And then uh, Tom Fuller and his staff goes on site and develop, um, does a worksite assessment, and they assist these businesses with improving their COVID-19 infection prevention strategies to protect workers. That can be in the form of helping them like with sanitation protocols or screening like temperatures when they come in and we base our guidelines off the CDC and after that's done we continue to be a resource for these uh, businesses so um, Tom Fuller and his team just reiterates that we're here as a health education res resource for them so if they have any subsequent questions regarding COVID-19 or other health concerns they can always um, come back to us uh, with those questions and I also wanted to highlight that we have been working with our community based organizations to develop a lot of materials. Um, currently, it's in the works um, materials to target the farm worker community and in terms of like safety protocols and so forth. And my colleague Joe uh, Prado will go more into that. Next slide. Another key component that we've been helping our um, our ag 
workers is by increasing their healthcare access. Wanted to highlight our uh, staff member, Reina Villalobos. So she's really been spearheading this effort for our department. Um, so in general, I just wanted to clarify that we've been working with federally qualified health centers. And for those who don't know, so these are a chain of clinics that really serve as a safety net for our community. Uh, federally qualified health centers known as FQHCs, they provide care for the medically underserved populations, the uninsured, and so they serve thousands of patients here in the uh, Central Valley, and our farm workers are a large portion of the patient base. And so earlier this year, the, our Department of Public Health executed contracts with five different uh, FQHCs, and we've had different um, uh, goals with this. So one of them is they've enhanced access to COVID-19 testing to both on-site and through mobile services to include no barrier convenient testing hours. Um, so we've, we've uh, talked with CBOs that have worked, uh, that are targeting farm workers, and we asked them what would work best to target these farm workers. They let us know, hey, late afternoons, evenings, weekends work great. So the FQHCs have worked uh, to set these hours available to address the needs of farm workers. So we, they can also get testing at the time. And then another highlight is that if a farm worker um, is found not to have a primary care doctor, then one key thing with this approach is that we connect them to a primary care medical home to ensure continuity of care. And so by background, I am a family medicine physician and continuity of care is, I know, really important. Dr. Vora mentioned earlier in his talks that, you know, people who have comorbid conditions like diabetes tend to have worse prognosis if it's not controlled in regards to COVID complications. So it's very important that we get more of our um, ag workers uh, plugged in with a primary care doctor. So uh, I think this is a great point that uh, the FQHCs are helping us do that. And then lastly, the FQHCs initiate medical case investigation. So if there is a positive uh, COVID patient, then they do contact tracing and so forth. Um, yeah, and then another thing I wanted to highlight is our program for uh, ag workers, farm workers that uh, for quarantine. So it's called the Healthy Harvest Program and it, it provides agricultural workers with temporary housing up to 14 days uh, free for the worker and it supports either isolation or quarantine. Um, so depending if you're positive or you've been exposed to somewhere to who's positive. Um, the nice thing is that it gives you wraparound services. So for example, three meals are provided. It transports the ag worker to and from the hotel. There's wildness checks and they're paired up with a case manager. So I think um, for anyone who knows uh, ha like the ag worker that may benefit from this program, we have more information on our Fresno County Department of Public Health website. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to, so these are just um, some of the big programs that we've been doing so far, but uh, I wanted to highlight that last week we had our first farm workers COVID-19 safety group. So it was it involved several members of our staff, our some CEOs that work on uh, farm workers, uh, our ag commissioner Melissa Cregan, representatives from our local farm bureau, and really we we're just working together uh, to see how we can better meet the needs of our farm workers. So I'm really excited about this new collaboration. Um, and there's other projects that we're brainstorming on and I'm excited to be on board and help out with this uh, project. And um, yeah, that's our that's where we're at right now. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Solis. And it's it's just so great to be working with you and we're glad to have you as part of the team and, and um, working in our community. So just wanna thank you so much for that and, and the great work you've been able to do in just a short period of time. Um, there's a lot going on in that space. And, you know, we have to recognize that the, the farming community, agriculture is not simple. The types of work that are done change seasonally. Uh, it can be complex in terms of the relationships between employers and, and the workers and so forth. And, and there's a lot of um, barriers to uh, the farm working community actually getting access to care. And, and um, you've done some great work in, in working with the partners to tear down some of those barriers and make sure that we do everything we can to protect our community. So thank you. Uh, next, we wanna talk for a few minutes about schools. Um, I know that we're running a little long. My team is um, uh, very uh, well informed on all these topics and, and um, spending time covering them. So we're gonna go a little bit long. We are recording this. So if you wanna watch some later, um, if you have to jump off, we understand. Uh, but um, uh, David Lucchini has been working on our school response 
And that's really been, they have been, the schools have been a partner with us from the beginning of the, of the COVID-19 response. And like I say, they've been not only just talking about um, teaching our kids in classrooms, but they really are a hub for the community to access resources of all different types. And uh, the school partners have been with us on our uh, department operations center calls um, daily for the beginning of the response. And then um, less um, as we've uh, kind of um, gotten into our, our groove um, a little bit less often, but they've been uh, a great resource working with us and um, David's been leading up that team. And before I turn it over to him, I want to thank him for uh, covering for me for a lot as I've been working on the Creek Fire. Um, he's been able to handle uh, many of the COVID response operations. So thank you, David, for that work and and I'm um, looking forward to your presentation. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, you guys missed. I said uh, we're gonna stretch real quick. We're at uh, 90 minutes in, so if you're if you're on, stretch your legs, stretch. I'm very loud. My voice carries, so you'll be able to hear me uh, from away from your laptop. So we're very fortunate uh, in this county. We've had strong relationships with our school districts for um, gosh, at least 20, 21 years. We've 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 uh, worked together in several. Uh, emerging infectious diseases over that period of time and as new school nursing leaders have come on the relationship has only gotten stronger and COVID has really highlighted that again uh, back in june we created a weekly group uh, where the school nursing leaders uh, met with our team to start discussing different scenarios and how they should respond as students uh, would return and staff return to the campus and so that helped us create uh, this return to school document that hopefully you have the time to go on our website. We have a lot of school resources on there and um, uh, we're very thankful. As, as we've talked about earlier, uh, Dr. Zweifler mentioned it, that uh, information changes on a regular basis. So uh, we're always tweaking the document and uh, we probably update it every four to six weeks as new information comes on. And Believe it or not, even in tomorrow's meeting, we'll be talking about different scenarios and see if we need to tweak that document a little more. The schools are very critical. There are eyes and ears out there in the community and what's happening on campus. And so they provide a great feedback to us to make sure we're providing guidance that's accurate, effective, and also easy to understand. So uh, we, we really cherish this, uh, this relationship and it's critical. Uh, as Dave said, they participate in our DOC meetings. We also have had heavy participation in Superintendent Yovino. He's the he's the superintendent of schools for Fresno County, and he got us involved uh, months ago to start participating in weekly superintendent meetings. And this has been also helpful. So you've got the health focus from the school health uh, school nursing uh, leaders, and then you've got the superintendents. So we're going to see things a little differently and have different questions. And so it's been extremely uh, uh, helpful to sit with them, talk with them. Uh, they've had very powerful questions that we've had to think about and really come up with the better responses. And I think we've come up with better uh, plans because of that and vice versa. The schools are coming up with better plans with these conversations. So we're very thankful for Superintendent Yovino to include us in these superintendent meetings once a week. Another thing we've gotten a lot of questions. Boy, youth sports is huge in the community. And I mean, we started getting questions about guidance for youth sports back in late May, early June. And so uh, our, our uh, liaison team has worked very closely uh, to put some stuff together. We've also changed, made some changes to this guidance uh, at least once a month that we, we felt it was very important to have some type of physical activity. So knowing that we couldn't do games and things like that, we at least uh, did some conditioning uh, that you'll see in the youth sports guidance that we felt could be done safely. And when we went to red, it allowed for the introduction of some uh, balls, depending on what sport they were playing, to also be allowed during this conditioning. At this time, there's still no scrimmaging allowed or games allowed. You may be seen in the community, but those are known us. <laughs> uh, the one thing that's different is uh, Fresno State obviously has been working very closely with us, and I'll cover that in our next slide when we talk about colleges. Uh, you've probably seen, uh, you've probably heard from the media and all that, and even from your own school districts, uh, the school waiver program started late August and we've had several schools already approved from the state when we we're in purple 
uh, to allow elementary schools to open. Uh, they did have to provide the plans that we uh, we have a team here reviewed and we had a lot of questions and they would uh, fix their plans up, uh, but they're excellent plans. And um, uh, we're very thankful for the work together with them. We're also thankful to the state. Once we've submitted these plans to the state, they have really turned around very quickly in three business days usually to get us back uh, an approved uh, waiver for these elementary schools to open. So just a reminder that if we do go to purple, hopefully we don't go to purple, that waiver will still be in place so elementary schools will not be closing. And the high schools and middle schools that did open, uh, once again, they do not have to be fully open, but if they open partially, if we do go back to purple, they are not required to close because that's a very common question we do get from parents and school districts. Another thing we're also developing that we get a lot of questions from the schools and parents is band, marching band music. So we are developing, uh, we hope to finalize by this week, some new guidance on band and music. So be, uh, be on the lookout for that. And then the next bullet, uh, the school testing surveillance program with the waiver program and with some secondary schools opening, it was critical for us to implement a testing surveillance program. And we had a lot of discussions in the weekly superintendent meetings on how this would work. And I also see there was a question about this program. And yeah, the goal here, originally the state was looking at 20, 25% of staff to get tested, but we felt we want to be uh, really realistic. And we thought 10% of staff, and this is 10% of staff that will be on campus working directly with students. So if staff members not on campus, they're not part of the pool that we would consider uh, to count the 10%. The so it's 10% of the staff that are working on campus directly with students that need to be tested. If, the, if a school's opening in October, then they'll probably need to do two cycles before the end of the calendar year. They're starting in mid-November, uh, later November, they'll do one cycle. School districts can work with uh, agencies that they have relationships with, federally qualified health centers, or some are working with our Fresno County Department of Public Health testing team. I think our team was just out at one of the school districts yesterday. So, so far things have gone well. The superintendents have been very supportive of this program, and they also understand that not only is it an important surveillance program to see, and this is just for their staff, not for students, uh, but it also increased our testing numbers. That, and as you recall, in the, the, the numbers that Dave was mentioning when he first started, uh, the state looks very closely at the number of tests we do in the community. So this will help with that. And finally, with uh, the, middle, uh, the secondary schools opening up as we are in red, we did ask the uh, middle schools and high schools uh, in districts, and it's actually the district who, who submits it, not every middle school or high school, but the district submits for all their middle school and high schools an attestation form for safe school openings that we're asking them to, to complete check the boxes that their plans include all these specific areas, and then they should also post their plan on their website so that their staff and parents can see it. All right, next slide so we can get going to our next two speakers. I'll just quickly go through higher education. Uh, once again, great relationships with Fresno State. We've always had, we've had a great relationship with Fresno State for the last several years. Um, and so we continue to grow that relationship with the COVID. Uh, we've talked about scenarios where they have cases how that's going to work with their staff and our team here. We talked about how they're going to be able to do lab classes on campus because there's certain classes you just can't do virtually. And so we talked about how they can do that safely. We, we discussed dorm safety. Uh, we work very closely, as I say, with the athletics uh, at Fresno State to be able to get a game going uh, Saturday. And I'll say this is follows the state guidelines. So everything we're doing at Fresno State follows what the state allows. This is not something that uh, we, did, we created our own because uh, we did get some questions why high school sports can't play at Fresno State. Well, the Fresno State's allowed because the, the state is not allowing high school and middle school sports to play at this time. So there's no guidance for them to play. For uh, higher education, there is guidance. It's a lot of testing. They're testing their players and coaches several times a week, so it's not cheap either. Uh, same with Fresno Pacific. We've been having several meetings with them for not only their athletics, but how they're doing their lecture halls uh their their dorm areas residential areas eating areas and their labs and then we've also have continued uh continuous meetings with the state center college uh group to discuss on campus safety uh, how they can do their labs uh, classes safely their sports staff safety and their safety measures for uh, specific events that they hold on campus and uh, we go over di different scenarios once again 
they have my cell uh, number, so they contact me on a regular basis when they have urgent issues or questions. And so we're constantly in touch. So we're very proud of our system. And if not, I'm not available, they know how to get a hold of other people from our team. And so uh, these relationships are critical so that uh, we, we do a good job in responding, hopefully preventing COVID from getting on campus. But if it does get on campus, that we do not have outbreaks. And that's what's very critical. So with that, I want to get to our next speaker. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, David. Um, really appreciate uh, that that presentation and all the work you've been doing on the, the school program. Um, we wanted to spend a few minutes. This is really kind of the point of the discussion that we started at the top of this with um, talking about what we call um, a whole community response. And um, we have uh, we also have to address the health equity metric now as part of our moving forward. And I believe that um, you know we are this is not new to us, but um, it does reflect a lot of the work we've been doing. And I would like for Melanie Ruvacaba to um, share with her um, thoughts from the department on how we're going to address the health equity measure. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Melanie Bubalkaba. I'm the program manager for the Office of Health Policy and Wellness here at the Department of Public Health. And I'm gonna do my best today to describe to you this new health equity metric and how it fits with our reopening Fresno County. Uh, next slide, please. So when the state announced the blueprint for a safer economy, uh, they included a new health equity metric. So when determining the county's tier, they look at uh, number one, the case rate, number two, the test positivity rate, and now number three, the health equity metric. Uh, the state recognizes, as do we, that some parts of the county are doing better than others in regards to COVID-19, but also in regards to other issues too. We are well aware of the existing health and economic disparities that already exist in our county, and we know that it's been exacerbated by COVID-19. The county, excuse me, the state just wants to ensure that we are addressing the needs of our most vulnerable populations so we do not increase these disparities any further. Hence, they have implemented this new metric as a means to help us reopen the county both safely and equitably. We also submitted a targeted investment plan that describes how we would target and provide resources to these vulnerable, vulnerable populations. And all of this was effective in October, October 6, 2020. Next slide. The health equity measure is determined by the California Healthy Places Index, or HPI. The HPI was developed by the Public Health Alliance of Southern California, and it's a tool used to assist in exploring local factors that predict life expectancy and comparing community conditions across the state. You can visit the site at www.healthyplacesindex.org if you want to check it out for yourself. Um, the census tracts for each county were divided into quartiles based on the HPI. Just to be clear, these quartiles did not take into account COVID-19 cases, just the health indicators that are measured by the HPI. The lowest performing quartile is where the state has decided that we as a county should focus our efforts. We should provide outreach, education, and resources to these communities, which will then help the county overall. By helping our most vulnerable population and those most in need, we are helping everyone so they don't fall further behind. Across the state, these census tracts are home to only 24% of Californians, but they account for about 40% of the COVID-19 cases. In Fresno County, there are 48 census tracts that make up our lowest quartile. And those 48 census tracts include about 250,000 residents. Next slide. So this is the map. I'm sorry it's not super clear, but it's, it's, it's the best we've got right now. This is the map that shows our lowest quartile census tracts. Um, you can see that it include, includes a large portion of our west side, including Mendota and San Joaquin. Some areas on the east side, including parts of Selma, Parlier, and Orange Cove, and large portions of the city of Fresno. The great news is that we have really the best community partners in this county and from the beginning of the pandemic we have worked with them diligently to try them try to meet the needs of our most vulnerable populations they have been great at bringing the needs to our attention and helping us find ways to resolve them together like dave mentioned in, in the beginning it's really a whole county approach um, we certainly can't do this alone as the health department one of our core values is our eight pillars of public health 
and that includes individuals, families, employers, educators, healthcare providers, community and spiritual leaders, and media partners, and public officials. And they have all been on board. You have all been on board since the beginning, since day one. We have a strong history of working closely with our community partners to address the disparities that exist in our county, and we're going to continue to work with those partnerships moving forward. Um, and many of you know, about a month ago, we executed several large contracts with some of our CBOs to really address these needs. As uh, Dr. Solis described, the partnerships with our FQs, we have lots of things in place to go ahead and address these issues. So we want you to know that we are on it. We're, we're with you doing this together, um, and we're happy to be in partnership with everyone. I know we're short on time, so I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to our next speaker who's going to talk more about our Fresno Equity Project, our COVID-19 Equity Project, and that's uh, Joe Prado. Hi, everybody. How are we doing today? Thank you for staying in the long haul here for uh, with our presentation. Um, so I really want to just focus in on what did equity look like during our response and the initial response, and then what have we been evolving into in our community? So let's um, let's go on to the next slide. And as through our evolution, you know, how are we keeping all this connected? As you heard a lot about FQHC involvement, ag-based um, businesses, um, all these other things. How do they? How does it all come together? Is just one goopy mess? Um, and I say it's it's a great molding and shaping that we're doing it for our community here. So um, just to focus in on what exactly were what was our equity focus at the beginning of the COVID response, and public information was really key out of the gate. Really developing culturally sensitive education materials, getting that out to all of our uh, populations in Fresno County, uh, not only. Um, not only through social media, through TV, through radio, through our ethnic media partners as well. Very heavy um, early on in our response. Um, also, as we moved on and through the equity lens of testing site locations, really picking out where can we do rural and metropolitan testing site locations. Early on, you remember there wasn't a lot of testing going on. We started at about 200 uh, COVID tests per day, and we've um, now, uh, I think at our highest peak, we're at about 2,800 tests per day. So huge improvement, uh, Fresno County overall, in, in really improving that testing. And once again, as our tests have gone down, we need to really reevaluate and be able to get those numbers up again. Um, and then really, we assisted training with the FQHCs, the skilled nursing facilities, and other medical providers on COVID testing. Why were we focused in so much on these areas? Because these, these particular partners deal directly with our vulnerable population. These particular providers deal directly with our um, areas, our people of color populations as well. So we needed to make sure that was really solidified in this response. And as we were doing and choosing where were we going to go, where were these site locations, before the California um, um, announced their Healthy Places Index, we have our very own county health priority index, um, something we developed back in 2015. And as we placed these resources in place, that was our equity lens. And we made sure that we were addressing um, these um, census tracts, these areas that were most health burdened. Um, and then as we're you know drinking out of a fire hose here, uh, we had an amazing proposal brought um, to us by the COVID Equity Project um, group. And so I'd like to go to the next slide. Yeah, and so really um, a very thorough um, proposal was submitted to us. It represented um, initially, the initial proposal represented um, two lead agencies and about um, 15, 16 or so CBO collaboration in the first initial um, proposal. And that was really focused um, with education outreach, not only at testing sites, but really already tapping into those networks already that exist in their in their footprint and really expanding COVID education and testing um, as as we move forward. Um, contract tracing um, and that is um, actually in place. Um, uh, these um, community based organizations have already and that is Fresno ESC building Healthy's community um, within 45 days of contract execution. They've hired um, 100 community health workers and have trained them um, and into the contract tracing world and have already deployed these assets. Mm -hmm. These are 100 individuals that live in these communities in the African American Coalition in the Immigrant Refugee Coalition in both rural and metro areas. Phenomenal job they have done with just 45 days in. So really excited about that. There was um, isolation quarantine supports. This is something that we saw really lacking with the initial funding um, from the state and some um, and, 
and other pieces. So we um, included in here actual funding uh, to folks that were impacted by COVID, either positive, exposed, or in close contacts. This is financial support that would go towards rent, mortgage, uh, utilities, um, any type of respite care, any type of distance learning, any type of um, issues they have within their home, um, we would be able to provide um, um, direct financial assistance to them through our CBO network. Um, and so as you can see, this is 7.3 million. As we were starting with the two, um, the two first um, coalitions with the African American Immigrant Refugee Coalition, um, Exceptional Parents Unlimited came on and with the access and functional needs um, population. So this has been added on. We're, we're finalizing their contract now. So once we finalize that here shortly, we're going to look at $7.3 million uh, into the CBO network and really being able to establish a good foothold. And really what this has been, it represents 21 community-based organizations working together. We didn't have this built at the first part of the response. So as we prepare ourselves for the second surge, Fresno County and its community will have a resource at its fingertips that it didn't have at the beginning. So very excited about um, what this COVID-19 equity project has done. Just exceptional leadership within these CBOs to be able to get it to where it's at today. Um, next slide. So um, how does COVID-19 equity project align with existing resources? So this is like the muddy mess I was kind of referring to earlier. So I just want to show you uh, last week a couple of pictures of what that actually looked like at one of our sites um, last week. Next slide. So um, last week we were at the Lanier Community Center. It's about 30 minutes south of, of, of downtown Fresno and really uh, focused on rural population here. And so the partnership here was amazing. We had the COVID equity team out there providing the education. We had our FQHC Family Health Care Network out there doing COVID testing. And the Lanier Community Service District, it was on their day they were doing a food distribution as well. And so um, it was just amazing as you see there. This is the beautiful chaos. You had one line for food and you had one line um, for COVID testing. And you really got to hear a lot of what um, the population, what the community thinks about COVID testing and why they're afraid to be um, tested and really um, reinforcing some of the um, supports we've included in the contract. But also now we know we need to change our education. We know um, the population has, um, has uh, other things that we need to address. Um, and so this was phenomenal. This was about 130 people that came through for food distribution. There was about um, 14 people tested for COVID that day. This is their first time. And so about a 10% of that uh, of people that came through that were actually tested for COVID. And so um, we're looking at a family health care network. They'll be out there twice a month and being able to provide COVID testing out there. So very good alignment of all these resources here. Now, something co does COVID-19 uh, equity project align with City of Fresno's equity project? So City of Fresno received funding. Act funding County of Fresno has, but are we working together? Is this um, is this all coming together? And the, and the answer is yes. I, our COVID Equity Project um, partners they established their scope of work, but also it's the same scope of work that City of Fresno is uh, supporting as well. So we've uh, we really have combined the administrative um, the administrative burdens to the CBOs in one. Um, we've really have combined the scope of work. And so that is just really coming off nicely so far. So we have communications with City of Fresno to make sure those are really aligning with the County of Fresno Public Health Department's vision of this response. And we're, and we're really, uh, really moving along well with that. Um, as we push forward, um, there's um, great um, alignment with UCSF. Their um, City of Fresno's main testing partner and Dr. Batista's office is coming online as well. So really establishing a framework that everybody just kind of falls under. And so I'm um, uh, really excited about what that is turning into in just a matter of 45 days of implementation. And that's all I have to present on COVID Equity Project. Dave, would you like to close this up? Yeah, thank you so much, Joe. And I think that that uh, your final presentation was, you know, really indicative of where we um, are better positioned um, as we head into the fall months to be able to be responsive to the areas of our community that are most at risk. You know, one of the things, the takeaways, the call to action from this group, from everybody who's on this call, there's over 200 people, organizations that have participated, um, is, you know, what what can you do to help um, with this with this response over the next few months? And so maybe you're a pastor of a local church wanting to better serve your community. 
Well, you know, um, we've got community-based organizations that may need space to do projects and may want to tap into your um, your congregation as um, potential recipients of benefits or uh, services that they can provide. Uh, we, we have community-based organizations that are listening in and we've challenged them to put on um, more frequent uh, low bar testing so we can and when we want that done by our community clinics because we want to establish a relationship with individuals not just to do a drive-through but to do a drive-through and have a have a nurse from family health care network or united health care centers meet with that person so there's a lot of connections that can be made through this group we've um uh, one other example is we have a number of our law enforcement partners that have participated you may be wanting to connect better with your youth we can offer some great opportunities for you to um, do some work in your community with the youth, uh, targeting all kinds of things, including COVID, and certainly with regard to how we're uh, how they're enduring, how are they getting through um, these tough times? And I know that our behavioral health partners would would help out as well. So it's really like picking up ends of the extension cords and making sure what fits together, and and how can we do a better job of of moving our community forward. You've got a very strong commitment from the team that was talking today and hundreds more that are supporting the team that talked to um, to help uh, take on the challenge of what comes over the next um, few months. We will be um, publishing this uh, presentation, uh, the recording of it on our website. So if you if you really want to um, um, study it again in thorough detail or maybe share it with somebody, it'll be available for you. We are also going to answer, we've answered a number of the questions in the live Q&A. Um, there are some that are going to take a little more time to uh, for us to work on. We'll um, answer those questions and send them back out to you as well. And so with that, um, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up the, the uh, conversation. I know we planned it for 90 minutes and went uh, just under two hours, but it's definitely a worthwhile topic and, and I really appreciate um, everyone joining in and all the hard work that you're doing to help um, <clears throat> make uh, Fresno County a safer place and and help to uh, help navigate us through this uh, pandemic. So um, with that, I think we'll end the presentation and thank you all very much for participating.